Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about perineal tendons, and this will be a little bit shorter than the second talk, which is about Achilles tendon ruptures. Um, because uh, James, he mentioned the perineal tendons in a couple of slides in his talk. So what I'm going to talk about is dislocation and rupture. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure to be here and uh, a very well organized course. And thanks for everything. Thank Diana for, for uh, arranging everything so well. Uh, perineal tendon dislocation is, is the first topic I'm going to mention. And the perineal tendon rupture is the second one. And this is purely a sports-related injury, especially in downhill skiing. And I understand that you are not doing so much downhill skiing here in Qatar. But uh, what we are really talking about oftentimes uh, today is football. Uh, this injury is often overlooked, and it's uh, probably more common than sometimes anticipated. And um, on this slide, we see the, see the injury. and. Uh, it's almost always the peroneus brevis tendon. It can be both tendons as well. And there are ways to, um, to uh, um, uh, localize this in, in terms of exactly where the superior peroneus, peroneal tend uh, superior peroneal uh, retinaculum is, is torn. It's not really torn. It's just lifted off the, the, uh, the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus. I'll come back to that. So what's specific about the peroneal tendon dislocation? We talk about acute dislocation, or we talk about the recurrent dislocation, which can be with or without trauma and can be hab habitual. Uh, there are some anatomical variations in, uh, in the area, like weak superior peroneal retinaculum or a uh, shallow groove. Um, there are two different ways of treating this, uh, if you're talking about the acute perineal tendon dislocation or the recurrent. The recurrent will never recover with uh, rehab or, or anything like that. If it's symptomatic, it needs surgery, always. If it's not symptomatic, you can leave it. Acute can be debated. Acute can be operated. Acute can also be left for uh, non-surgical treatment. And there is, all, there is definitely a lack of, uh, of good uh, level one or level two randomized studies. So why should we treat this? Because not everybody has a functional impairment. And the long-term um, long sequels are not very, very well known. And uh, we can easily see this. People can provoke the, uh, the uh, dislocation of the tendon. Uh, and sometimes this is asymptomatic. I have one of my, one of my colleagues who has had this for more than 20 years. He doesn't have much pain. He can play football. He is, he is almost 50 years old, and he still plays football. And he doesn't have a problem. He does absolutely, want, doesn't, absolutely not want to operate, be operated on. So uh, we talk about evidence for rehab or surgery. There is, there is no major evidence for either, either thing. If you are talking about the acute uh, peroneal tendon dislocation, if you talk about the chronic, the evidence is, is surgery if it's symptomatic. So this, uh, this, and if we go for non-surgical uh, non treatment of the acute dislocation, it can also de be debated whether we should just leave it, uh, put on a brace, or maybe immobilize in, in, in a plaster or, or brace for six weeks or something like that. Uh, we really don't know uh, the outcome of these, uh, of these different treatment options because there is a lack of randomized studies. When we come to surgical treatment for, for chronic or recurrent dislocations, we talk about skeletal procedures and soft tissue procedures. And uh, I'm going to run through a couple of these now. The skeletal procedures are much more technically difficult, and there are some risk of complications, and, and those complications have been well reported in, in the literature. And this is, uh, they are mainly based on, on uh, making the uh, posterior bone bulk a little bit uh, bigger in order to make sure that the tendons won't uh, come around this way. Uh, another way is to, is to deepen the sulcus and uh, make sure that the tendons stay behind uh, where the uh, retinaculum is uh, uh, re-fixed uh, to, the, to the posterior part. 
this is also this is quite difficult to do really, uh, and uh, it's much much easier to uh, to to draw it in a picture than to do it in, in real life in the in the wound. Uh, this is another way of doing it. This is uh, uh, called the rice procedure, and it maybe is the easiest one. But this also has uh, been reported to have complications like. Uh, uh, a dislocation of the screw, dislocation of the of the bone piece, etc. So I would say that I like my favorite treatment for this is a soft tissue procedure, and this is kind of a um, similar to the uh, anatomic reconstruction of of the uh, of the ankle ligaments. And uh, what we do is that we incise the superior perineal retinaculum, and we leave uh, a bridge. Uh, maybe a two or three or four millimeters uh, in front. And there is always tissue here and behind this, kind of like a bursa, where the, where the, where the, where the retinaculum is a kind of a, a peeled off. It's not ripped, it's not, uh, there is never a rupture in, in the retinaculum. So when we have uh, uh, made sure that uh, we have removed the bursa-like tissue, uh, we just shorten the posterior part of the retinaculum and reinsert it to the uh, posterior part of the lateral malleolus. And I usually use uh, th uh, three, possibly four drill holes and non-absorbable sutures. And this means that this part of the retinaculum will be, be uh, on the underside of the posterior part of the lateral malleolus. This is the brevis and this is the longest tendon. And um, when we are finished, or more or less finished, it looks like this. And um, in some cases, uh, there is also a, a insufficiency of the anterior of the TFA and the CF ligaments, and then they can be reimplicated uh, at the same time. What I end up here with is to take a, a use a periosteal flap and the proximal part of the retinaculum and duplicate it with a suture that's down there. Okay, postoperatively I usually immobilize these patients in, in a plaster or brace for about six weeks. It's very probable that can, you can do this quicker, but uh, I've re never really done it. We have um, published on this in the Scandinavian uh, Journal of Medicine and Science in Sports and with very reasonable results in terms of range of motion, strength, stability, and function, and, uh, uh, and the re, uh, recurrence rate is, is really low. So I must say I, I like this procedure. So the recommendation in terms of perineal tendon dislocation in, in acute is non-surgical treatment and recurrent soft tissue re, uh, reconstruction. If you come to the next thing, it's uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, and we come to the perineus brevis rupture, which is probably much more common than uh, we usually anticipate. And then I think this is a very uh, important differential diagnosis, especially uh, when we have uh, long-term problems after ankle uh, distortion and problems that won't go over uh, with uh, what we may call normal uh, rehab. Uh, so, and then we might be talking about the longitudinal rupture of the peroneus, peroneus brevis tendon. And it's almost always in the peroneus brevis tendon in more than 90%. And it's a partial rupture is probably more common than, we, than has previously been mentioned. And it might also be an important reason for inferior result after treatment of ligament injury. So what we see is that the circulation is insufficient in the tendon, and this is the longest tendon here. It's, it's a normal tendon, and this is the split peroneus brevis tendon. It's the posterior part and the anterior part, and a split in between. And there can be two splits, there can even be three splits, and there will be no tissue healing. There is absolutely no way of doing anything with rehab or anything like that if this patient is, is symptomatic. The only way to treat it is, is by surgery. And sometimes there is a, there is a split in the tendon, and uh, the superior peroneus retinaculum is peeled a little bit off. And I think actually I think it's uh, it is the 
posterior edge of the lateral malleolus that creates this uh, longitudinal rupture. Sometimes we have a concomitant injury to the peroneus brevis tendon and the ligaments, and we need to stabilize the ankle joint and, uh, and do the tendon reconstruction as well. And in every case we stabilize the ankle joint, we need to look for the tendon because uh, it is more often than, than we previously have discussed, really. So this is an inversion injury, and, and the ligament injury is the primary thing, and the rupture of the, of the peroneus retinaculum, and the peroneal brevis tendon is the secondary thing. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, this, in this picture we see it very well, this is the longus tendon, and this is the split in the, in the peroneus brevis tendon. So I've already said this, the ligament injury is the primary thing leading to the recurrent give away of the ankle joint. And we should remember this injury when we have recurrent giving way and retromalleolar pain. And there is a retromalleolar swelling and retromalleolar pain. And that's the clinical indication for it's especially looking at the tendon. If you look at the way to um, uh, for of the, of the preoperative evaluation, uh, stress rays are not very useful. I actually don't think stress rays are useful, uh, are, are very useful uh, ever. I had stress rays as a, a big part of my thesis uh, many, many years ago, and I didn't really find any, any good correlation between stress rays and, and symptoms. Ultrasonography is uh, like in, in this. Uh, um, Ultrasonography uh, picture is, is good. Here's the normal tendon, and here's the rupture. And MRI is, is also very good. And we can see the normal longus tendon here, and we can see the brevis tendon with two splits. So, as I mentioned, the only way of treating this, I, we also published on this in the Scandinavian Journal, uh, the only way of treating this is by surgery, and there is no way uh, rehab can be helpful before surgery. It's very helpful after surgery. Perform it with a, a posterior lateral incision, and the peroneal tendon sheath is divided behind the insertion to the lateral malleolus. And then we do a reconstruction of the tendon, both uh, uh, on the uh, after the um, after the degenerated a degenerated tissue is removed, and then the tendon is repaired with suture, uh, with a deep suture, and then we close it. Uh, and close it again, so the, we'll create a new normal tendon. And this is the deep suture, and then we close this end to this, this side to this side, this side to this side. So, and we create the tendon, reconstruct the tendon again. And, uh, and this is a side-to-side -side suture, and thereafter there is a reconstruction of, of the superior peroneus retinaculum in the same manner. Uh, reconstruction of the ligaments, if needed. Postoperative rehab after immobilization in plaster for six weeks. Again, I think we can be quicker there, but uh, uh, I'm not really sure, uh, and I have not tested it, and there is no study really that has, has, uh, uh, has done any randomized work on it. So, retromalleolar pain combined with giving way, with typical lo uh, localization behind the lateral malleolus, and where instability of the ankle joint is the primary issue and pain is the secondary. And then we should look for both the ankle instability and the tendon problem. And the tendon injury should always be looked for and repaired simultaneously, the ligament reconstruction. Thanks.